Amen. But I'm thrilled that we're here tonight. I'm thrilled that we're in uh, stage two uh, and tonight and look forward uh, to the next stage. I'm going to read to you the entire chapter of chapter 20 uh, of Genesis. I need to do that to really get a total picture of what I want to preach tonight uh, to you, my friends. Uh, Genesis chapter 20, beginning in verse number 1 uh, through verse 18. And Abraham journeyed from thence towards the south country and dwelt between Kadesh and Shur and sojourned in Gerah. And Abraham said of Sarah his wife, She is my sister. And Abimelech, king of the Gerah, sent and took Sarah. But God came to Abimelech in a dream by night and said to him, Behold, thou art but a dead man for the woman which thou hast taken, for she is a man's wife. But Abimelech had not come near her. And he said, Lord, wilt thou slay also a righteous nation? Said he not unto me, She is my sister? And she, even she herself said, He is my brother. In the integrity of my heart and innocency of my hands have I done this. And God said unto him in a dream, Yea, I know that thou didst this in the integrity of thy heart, for I also withheld thee from sinning against me. Therefore suffer I thee not to touch her. Now therefore restore the man his wife, for he is a prophet, and he shall pray for thee, and thou shalt live. And if thou restore her not, know thou that thou shalt surely die, thou and all that are thine. Therefore Abimelech rose early in the morning and called all his servants and told all these things in their ears, and the men were sore afraid. Then Abimelech called Abraham and said unto him, What hast thou done unto us? And what have I offended thee? And excuse me, and what have I offended thee? That thou hast brought on me and on my kingdom a great sin. Thou hast done deeds unto me that ought not to be done. And Abimelech said unto Abraham, What sawest thou that thou hast done these things? And Abraham said, Because I thought, Surely the fear of God is not in this place, and they will slay me for my wife's sake. And yet indeed she is my sister, She's the daughter of my father, but not the daughter of my mother. And she became my wife. And it came to pass when God calls me to wander from my father's house, that I said unto her, This is thy kindness which thou shalt show unto me. At every place whither we shall come, say of me, He is my brother. And Abimelech took sheep and oxen and men servants and women servants, and gave them unto Abraham, and restored him Sarah, his wife. And Abimelech said, Behold, my land is before thee. Dwell where it pleaseth thee. And unto Sarah he said, Behold, I have given thy brother a thousand pieces of silver. Behold, he is to thee a covering of the eyes unto all that are with thee, and with all other. Thus she was reproved. So Abraham prayed unto God, and God healed Abimelech and his wife and his maidservants, and they bare children. For the Lord have fast closed up all the wombs of the house of Abimelech because of Sarah, Abraham's wife. Heavenly Father, now I pray you might bless the preaching of the word of God tonight. I thank you, Father, for your leadership, and I pray, Father, you would help me to say the things you had me to say. And, Lord, uh, I pray this might be a blessing and encouragement to each and every one. And I thank you for the privilege to stand behind this pulpit. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. You may have to forgive me a little bit. I have the eye water syndrome. I got too close to Steve Wright, I think, and got what he's got. But I want to take these verses tonight and portray here a uh, horrible failure in the life of one of God's choice servants. 
If you remember Abraham's journey uh, down to Egypt in Genesis chapter 12, verses 10 to 20, you notice that he did the very similar thing that what he's done here. And friends, it is never pleasant to see failure in one of God's children. But I'm thankful that God did not take Abraham's sins and just sweep them under the rug. I'm grateful that he saw fit to record the event here in the pages of Scripture that I read tonight. And I'm grateful because like Abraham, I struggle with sin sometimes. And sometimes I struggle with the same sin over and over and over. And my friends, I know that you do too. What we need in the midst of our struggle is some encouragement tonight. And that's what I want to do. I want to encourage you. I don't want to beat you up, but to help you. What we need is that blessed assurance that we have in the midst of our failures. This passage offers the hope to our hearts this evening that it may seem like a passage of darkness, of gloom, my friends, and failure, But in reality, my friends, it is a passage filled with hope and help for you and for me. I want to point out a few principles tonight that are contained here and speak to your need and my need as well. I want to preach for a while on sin and the saint of God. My very first point is sin does not have an expiration date. Sin does not have an expiration date. Remember that Abraham here is 100 years old when this event occurs. And when he did the same thing in Genesis chapter 12, he was just beginning his walk with the Lord. Therefore, he should be at the height of his maturity as a believer. And notice also, this is a sin he carried with him for many decades. Look at verse number 13 of this passage of Scripture. Verse number 13 says, And I came, and it came to pass, when God calls me to wander from my father's house, that I said unto her, This is thy kindness which thou shalt show unto me. At every place whither we shall come, say of me, He is my brother. Who was Abraham thinking about? Only himself and his own skin. That's all that he was thinking about. For us, the point is clear. There'll never be a time when we will be be beyond failing, my friends. And therefore, we need to avoid some of the mistakes that Abraham made. Number one, under number one, Used his letter A, I got one. Listen to this clearly. Never stop trusting God to take care of you. I'll say that again. Never, never, never stop trusting God to take care of you. Why was Abraham there in the first place? Well, in Genesis chapter 12, he went because of a famine not believing that God could provide for his needs. This time, we're not told why he is here, and uh, it may be in a little bit of fear because of what happened at Sodom and Gomorrah. He probably thought maybe uh, God was going to continue his wrath upon that area. Now, when we come to the place where we no longer trust the Lord to meet our needs and get us through the trials of life, We are headed for disaster. And my friends, we all have a trial of life around us right now called coronavirus 19. And some people have exercised great scarcity, being scared. Great fear is the word I'm looking for. And have hid themselves and are still hiding themselves. I never will forget this. I was... uh, uh, I went to Walmart down in Florida, and I had masks and gloves on. 
Common sense. You need to use common sense. Amen? And I passed this woman that had a mask on, and she had a scarf, big scarf, all wadded up and holding it on the mask uh, with her left hand, and I watched her for a little bit while she's pushing the cart and getting groceries with her right hand. Amen? Now, uh, I'd say she had great fear. But my friends, there's great fear all over our country. And let me say this. We need to use common sense, but above all else, put our faith and trust in our keeper, God himself. That's what I want to do. That's what we should do. And that's what Abraham, we see here in this incident, did not do. When we come to the place where we no longer trust the Lord to meet our needs and get us through the trials of life, we are headed for disaster. Now think of this. Never put yourself in the place of temptation. Abraham had a fear that some man would kill him so he could have Sarah. That was Abraham's fear. And when he felt this fear, he was inclined to lie to save his hide not believing God would be able to take care of him. And when we fail to exercise faith, we're not trusting God. When we see something and we think that we can take care of it ourselves and leave God out of it, we're headed for trouble, my friends. Only a fool would subject himself to temptation's lure and believe that he will walk away unharmed. We all have sins. And we all have areas of temptation. And the best thing to do is stay away from those places. Amen? Do not expose yourself to it. We don't want to be exposed to the virus. Don't let us go into the place where we know we'll have temptation in our life. When temptation comes, you and I need to be like Joseph. Genesis 39. What did he do? He ran. When temptation comes his way, he ran. And you and I, my friends, need to do the very same thing. And friends, we must never let down our guard. Never let down your guard. May we never come to think that we've arrived at a place where we cannot sin or where we are free uh, from the temptation to commit any or a particular sin. As sure as you let down your guard, you're headed for trouble. 1 Corinthians 10, 12 says, Wherefore, let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. And I love 1 Peter 1, 5, speaking to the the Christians, the born-again folks. It's, uh, It's such a wonderful verse. And it said, Whom are kept by the power of God through faith, under salvation, ready to be revealed the last time. We're kept, my friends, by him. Oh, what a joy it is to know that. Amen. Second point I want to make, sin cannot overcome grace. Now think about that for a minute. Sin cannot overcome grace. Even though Abraham is clearly out of God's will at this time of his life, he is still enjoying the Lord's blessings. That may mess up some theology tonight, but it's still true. You see, even when Abraham is in a place of his own choosing, is not doing what God would have him to do, he is still being blessed by the Lord. Notice the blessings that came his way. Uh, In verse 17, he forgave him of his sins. That is implied in verse 17. Uh, In verses 2 through 9 and verse 18, he protected him from harm. In verses 14 through 16, he blessed him richly financially. And in verse 17, he used him for his glory. This same principle we find in 1 Kings chapter 19 Uh, in the life of Elijah. Now, what does this all teach us? Simply the truth that who we are in Jesus 
cannot be invalidated by sin. We are still his sons and daughters. We all know that God chastens his children. Revelation 3.19 As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. Hebrews chapter 12, verses 6 through 12. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteth, and scourge every son whom he receiveth. If ye endure chastening, God deal with you as with sons. For what son is he whom the Father chasteneth not? But if, furthermore, here we go, thank you. But if ye be without chastisement, wherefore are all partakers? Then are ye bastards and not sons. Furthermore, we have had fathers of our flesh which corrected us, and we gave them reference. Shall we not much rather be in subjection unto the Father of spirits and live? For they verily for a few days chasten us after their own pleasure. But he for our profit, that we might be partakers of his holiness. Now no chastening from the present seemed to be joyous, but grievous. Nevertheless, afterward it yieldeth the peaceful fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby. Wherefore, lift up the hands which hang down and the feeble knees. Now, my friends, however we look at this, how many of us could testify to the truth that there have been times when we were miles away from the Lord? I know it's been such in my life, but he even still blessed us. Even though we were away from him in some things in our life, he still blesses our lives. Now, what is this? Nothing less than grace. The wonderful grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. And my friends, this just serves to remind us that God deals with us on the basis of who we are rather on the basis of what we do. Right. Now, think of this with me. Our salvation is not performance-based, right. right. but it's in the precious uh, blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. But this does not give us a license to sin. Does not do that. After all, the redeemed sinner is going to want to serve the Lord. If you're saved and born again and you have sin in your life, you're still going to want to serve the Lord if he lives within you. And you will not rest until things are right between you and the Lord and myself and the Lord. It is also true that after a while, God will deal directly and completely with the sin that resides in his children's heart. God wants all of our heart. Yeah. All of our heart. Yeah, I, I could go to tears if I said much about it, but God's been far, far better to me than I ever deserved. How many times in situations, Brother David, that I've been in that looked like it could lead to the end of my life and God brought me out of it. I know David has commented to me about that and I stand in amazement that God would bless a sinner like me. But thank God, even our sin is unable to separate us from the love of the Lord Jesus Christ. And of course, that leads me to Romans chapter 8, my favorite chapter in the Bible, verses 10 through 14. I'm sorry. Uh, (laughs) uh, Chapter 8, 38, verse 38 and 39. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities nor powers nor things present nor things to come shall, nor height, nor death, nor any other creature, shall be able to separate us from the love of God, 
which is Christ Jesus our Lord. COVID-19 cannot separate us from the love of God. What mess we got ourselves into by the decisions we made cannot separate us from the love of God. There's nothing down here. There's no power, no wicked power. There's nothing, nothing, nothing. The height nor death or any other creature that shall be able to separate us from the love of God. And we need to think on that. And we need to praise God for that. He is such a wonderful, wonderful Savior to you and to me. And number three, my last point. Sin cannot derail God's plan. The plans that God has cannot be derailed by your sin or my sin. When Abraham left the promised land to, to enter Gerah, he placed the plan of God in jeopardy. You see, God had promised to send the promised seed within a year. Genesis chapter 18, 10 through 14. We'll not go there, but you can write that down. And Abraham showed very poor judgment. If Abimelech had been allowed to sleep with Sarah, it, it could have short-circuited God's plan. And of course, the scripture tells us God preventing, prevented anything like that from happening. Another problem is the fact that Abraham is a sole representative of God in this country. Look in verse number 7, chapter 20, verse number 7. Therefore, restore the man his wife, for he is a what? Three people were here. Because he is a prophet. prophet. And he shall pray for thee, and thou shalt live. And if thou restore her not, know thou that thou shalt surely die, thou and all that is thine. He had been commissioned to be a blessing to all those that he come in contact with, wherever he went. Instead of being a blessing and a witness for God, Abraham, my friends, life could have been a hindrance to prevent Abimelech from coming to God. However, in spite of Abraham's sin, God spoke to Abimelech and dwelt with him anyway. And we see this in verses 6 and 7. And God declared to Abimelech that Abraham was a prophet. Now, regardless of what we do, God's plan will be accomplished. Now, I hate to say this, but I've thought a lot about this. In past years, too many preachers and evangelists had tried to keep the people of God in line by using fear tactics against them. Saints were told to live right or God can't bless. He can't work and he can't save souls. And if you don't witness, you will sin somebody to hell. Well, I want to set the record straight tonight, my friends. You cannot hinder God from doing his work. You might miss out on the blessings of what's going on, of being a part of what he's doing, but God will accomplish his will in the church and in the world when we cooperate, whether we cooperate or not. God's work will be completed according to his will. Another thing, you cannot, as I said, send somebody to hell. Men go to hell when they refuse to receive the Lord Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. And nothing you or I do can cause them to do that or prevent them from doing that. That may not be what you want to hear all your life, but it's still true. Our job is to warn them and to live right before them, but the decision they make in the end is theirs and theirs alone. When I think back about this, I remember as a young man installing telephone systems. I was a contractor and I traveled all over the state of Ohio, was in Michigan as well, should have known better than that. But uh, uh, anyway, I, I was witness to two or three times. 
I remember in particular when I was installing the phone box on the outside of a man's house, that he'd come out to me and talk to me in a very folksy way. It was in southern Ohio. And he witnessed to me and asked me if I was saved. Well, guess what? I didn't want to hear it. I said, sure, I'm saved. I lied to him. Amen? There's been a couple other times that I've said things that were not true to get away from this religious thing. But there came a day in my life when God's conviction of work on my life came to a point where I walked down the aisle of church, told a preacher, boy, do I need Jesus. God's work is not hindered, my friends. Even ourselves, uh, we can hinder it, but God keeps after us. He keeps talking to us. He keeps wanting us to be saved. Do you know that Abraham's sin should have shamed Abraham? But there's no indication they ever acknowledge it or repent it of it. Much like many in our world today, but think about Abraham's sin was used as a testimony to the greatness of God. Abimelech would have never known that God was a God of mercy, a God of grace, a God of forgiveness, a God of restoration if that old saint had never fallen into sin. Think about that. Abimelech would have never known or experienced those things. But because he did, God was able to demonstrate his power through forgiving and restoring Abraham by grace. Again, I I can't overemphasize, this is not an excuse for sinning. It's just a reminder that our sin will not stop God from saving people. God will not stop his work in the church. People need to know that our God is a God who saves and keeps through grace. When Abraham is confronted by his sin, he does not repent, but instead he offers up excuses. Here they are. They aren't much, but they're the same ones people still use today. Look at verse number 11 of chapter 20. Abraham said, because I thought surely the fear of the Lord is not in this place and they will slay me for my wife's sake. Look with me. And my friends, it was fear that caused this terrible event. It was a lack of faith at that time. Now look at verse number 12. He twists the facts here in verse number 12. Yet indeed she is my sister. She is the daughter of my father, but not the daughter of my mother. And she became my wife. Sarah was his sister, but she was more than that. She was his wife. And then he hid, my friends, his past failures. In verse number 13, look what is said. It came to pass when God calls me to wander from my father's house that I said unto her, this is thy kindness which thou shalt show unto me at every place whether we come any of me, he is my brother. He tells the king that this is the way we've always done it. Wherever we went, scripture records two occasions, but Abraham indicates wherever they went, he would tell the lie that she was his sister. Abraham's response to being confronted is to attempt to hide behind uh, some flimsy excuse. And you and I have done the same thing. Same thing. You know, I'm looking forward to when everything opens up, when I can shake hands. I still have to catch myself and draw back, you know. I'm so used to shaking hands and greeting folks and hugging folks sometimes, just the men, not the women. And uh, But anyway, uh, uh, I'm so used to that, I miss that. And I look forward, my friends, when we all be back here together when this is all behind us. But at the same time, as Pastor Holmes mentioned, 
about people at home in their pajamas drinking coffee, listening to the radio. <laughs> I hope a lot of our dear friends do not get in the habit now of staying home and relaxing. You never ever get church as you get church here while you are present. The radio is great. I appreciate it. But it does not totally replace the wonderful joy of coming together and feeling God's blessing and mercy and grace upon us as we sing and worship him. Amen. Right, right, yes, right. As we sang that one song tonight, I relive my salvation, thinking about how I got saved, when I got saved, where I got saved. I relived it, thought all about it. And oh, what a joy, my friends, that is. So my friends, let's do not, let's do not allow an excuse to become part of our life where we excuse ourselves from doing what we know God wants us to do and we know what is right to do. When we sin and are found out, we always try to make excuses for our behavior. We will either blame somebody else, and I've heard this so many times, uh, or the devil made me do it. <laughs> and we all know the answer to that. Devil cannot make us do anything, my friends. We may try to pretend that we didn't do anything wrong. We may plead ignorance. We may act like we see no wrong in our actions. There are a thousand ways, my friends, you and I, through the flesh, can handle sin. But there's only one way, only one way, my friends, that will bring cleansing, restoration, and the blessings of God. Sin must be confessed. It must be dragged, kicking, and screaming out into the open and must be exposed for what it is. It is black, it's dirty, and it's wicked. Now listen to God's way, Proverbs 28, chapter 13. He that covereth his sins shall not, what's that word? Prosper. For whoso confesseth and forsaketh them shall have mercy. And we all know 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Now let me ask you tonight, what excuses are you hiding behind this evening? Whether you know it or not, others may already know what you're hiding. God has a way of exposing the things that we hide in our life. You'll never get past it until you see for yourself and deal with it God's way. Now, as I conclude this tonight, we all battle sin, my friends. Some of us more than others. We all fight it nevertheless. The question is, who is winning the battle? You or your sins. Friends, if you want to be free, I want you to know you can be. If you want to be a light to the world, you can be. If you want to have your life to be blessed and to be a blessing, you can have it. And all it takes is for you and I doing what Abraham refused to do. Get before the Lord, face your sins for what they are, if you do, God will forgive you. And not only forgive you, but he'll bless you. And he'll restore you and use you for his glory. Now let me ask you tonight, does that sound good to you? Amen. Yeah. If you need that kind of help, it's available in Jesus. You come to him and watch him work your problem's all out for you at an old-fashioned altar. And I invite you to come tonight. If God has spoken to you, I invite you to come. Let's stand together, please.